we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. Come on, we got home training. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. I want us to get ready for where we're going. Um, so, you know, we're going to read the message Bible today because it's, it's going to be a little bit of a fun ghetto translation. Um, and many of you know uh, what took place at the Oscars. And um, that has been the root of many conversations and social debates and awarenesses and arguments and statuses and issues and drama. Um, I think there's something in it that I want us to pull from. And just in case you've been asleep all week, <laughs> you took this week for fasting and prayer, and you weren't on social media or television because you've been spending time with the Lord, um, there was a moment where um, Chris Rock, being who he is, um, was telling some jokes, and one of his jokes was at the expense of Jada Pinkett Smith, and um, it touched a very sensitive place uh, for her, and um, her husband made a decision that based on this moment, and, and I feel like you disrespected my wife, that um, I'm not going to leave it in God's hand, and I'm going to take it in my own hands. And he wanted to physically address what was verbally said. And he apologized later because his lack of restraint. Um, and I think there's something in this we're going to find that Will's not the only one who's had moments where there's been a lack of restraint. I think if, we, if the truth be told, all of us have had moments in our life where we've been tempted. And in those moments, we've allowed our temptation to get the best of us. So for the next few moments, as we get ready to read this text, I want to tell you up front, I want to preach from the subject willpower. Just tell somebody willpower. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4. It says then... It says, next, Jesus was taken into the wild by the Spirit for the test. Everybody say the test. Yeah. <clears throat> the devil was ready. Y'all got to read your Bibles. The devil was ready to give it. It's the devil coming to test Jesus. Y'all got to see this. Jesus, in another translation, it says, was led by the Spirit. This says, he was taken into the wild by the Spirit, which shows me that Satan can't do things on his own. But there's something that you have to remember that although he seems like he's a boss, he's really a glorified employee. And so he can't make decisions on his own. He needs permission, which means that everything that comes your way is permitted by God. I hope y'all ready for this. So Jesus was taken into the wild by the Spirit for the test. Everybody say the test. And the devil was ready to give it. Jesus, pay attention to the Bible, prepared for the test by fasting 40 days and 40 nights. That left him, of course, in a state of extreme hunger which the devil took advantage of in the first test. Since you are God's son, notice it's son, capital S-O-N, and I teach you in this church, a growing church is a what? Anytime you see in the scriptures, this is how people misunderstand who Jesus is because they think he's the son of God like he's God Jr. or he's little God like he's just the son, he's the offspring. No, he is God. Somebody shout, he is God. 
So when you see son of God in the Bible and you see capital S, it's not just son. It really is the self of God. So he's saying you are God. He's, he's saying he's acknowledging that he's God. Since you are God, you are the self of God. Speak the word that will turn these stones into loaves of bread. And Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. Some of y'all know it. It says man cannot live by bread alone. Okay, y'all with me. And then he says in verse 5 and 6, he says, For the second test, the devil took him to the holy city. He sat him upon the top of the temple. And since you are God, got to remember this, since you are God's son, he says, jump. And the devil goaded him by quoting Psalm 91. I hope y'all catch this theme. He has placed you in the care of angels. They will catch you so you don't, so you won't so much as stub your toe on a stone. And Jesus countered with another citation from Deuteronomy. Don't you dare test the Lord your God. This is another good verse when people say Jesus never said he's God because it says right here, don't test the Lord your God. Okay, y'all missed that, but you catch it on Wednesday. It's going to remind you in small groups. Okay, for the third test, check this out. This is getting good. For the third test, the devil took him to the peak of a huge mountain. He gestured expansively, pointing out all the earth's kingdoms, how glorious they all were. This is the devil speaking to Jesus. Then he said, they're yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. Just go down on your knees and worship me, and they're yours. Jesus' refusal was curt. Beat it, Satan! He backed his rebuke with a third quotation from Deuteronomy. Worship the Lord your God and only him. Serve him with absolute single-heartedness. Verse 11 the test was over. The devil left, and in his place, angels, angels came and took care of Jesus' needs. Again, I'm going to preach from the subject willpower. Everybody say willpower. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. So what's interesting when we read this and we consider what we were talking about at the Oscars, people were going crazy because Will Smith talks about Denzel's quote to him. When he has this moment where he falls into the temptation, Denzel Washington, a known Christian, he says something to him. He said, at your highest moment, that's when the devil comes for you. And I was thinking about this because when we look at the text, this is Jesus almost in one of the highest moments of his life at that point. Because although he is God, he is still man. It's called the hypostatic union. He's 100% God. but He's also 100% man, which means that he's wrestling between two wills. <laughs> he's wrestling between two natures because on one hand all of us deal with this we all have a human nature but God when he saves us calls us into divine nature now I'm not suggesting that you and I are God but I am suggesting that the Bible says that when we're saved it is no longer us that's alive but it's God that's living through us so now that we're born again, everybody say born again. Now that we're born again by the Spirit, it's not about us. It's all about him. So now we are supposed to live in a way that we are led by the Spirit so we don't fall to the temptations of the flesh. Jesus constantly has to deal with his own will as a man and the will of the Father. How can I prove that? How can we prove that there were two wills at work? Not that Jesus had a sinful nature, but he did have a human nature. 
His human nature allowed him to be hungry. His human nature allowed him to be thirsty. His human nature gave him emotions. Jesus wept. Jesus had all types of different things because he was human, so he also had two wills. Well, how do we know? Where does the Bible say that Jesus had two wills? Jesus, when he goes to die on the cross, and we're going to talk about that on Easter, but he's going to die on the cross, and he's praying this famous prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's sweating like blood bullets coming out. He's stressed out because he knows he's getting ready to die on the cross, and he says this famous prayer that many of us don't really, we quote it, but we don't really listen to the details. He said, Let if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He doesn't stop there. He says, nevertheless, here it is, not my will, but your will be done. So how can he be God and say your will and my will? Well, he's talking about the will of his flesh. Because all of us have to come to the understanding that no matter how much we pray and how much we worship and how much we attend church and how much we give and how much we tithe and how much we hallelujah, holler back, with all of that, it does not matter. You still have two wills. You're always wrestling. You're always fighting against two wills. When I would do good. Yeah. Yeah evil is present. Paul breaks this down in Romans chapter 7 and he talks about this struggle between two worlds and he says, I know that the law is spiritual. I know that the law is good. I love the law of God. If it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't know I was wrong. I wouldn't know that I was displeasing God. I wouldn't know that I fell short. But here's what happens. He says, you can't stop at what the law says because when it comes to notifying you the law is wonderful but when it comes to justifying you the law can't do it so he says the law is good and I see how good the law is but the law takes advantage of me in my weakness because it only shows me it doesn't help me he says so so I'm wrestling because now that I know what's right and what's wrong I struggle to do the right thing In my mind, he goes, in my mind, I serve the Lord. But with my members, with my body, I serve Satan. And I know we don't like talk like that. Some of y'all just got real nervous and tight. But have you ever had those moments when you knew to do right, but you chose to do wrong? I'm not talking about because you struggled. I'm talking about because you wanted it. Okay, all right, let me find my church. Have you ever known what God wanted, what God said, what God expected? Even some stuff that's not even that deep. Some money that you shouldn't have spent, but you spent today. There's some things in your mind you knew to do. But you fell to the temptation in your life. It's funny because the scholar and theologian Oscar Wilde says this. He says, I can resist anything but temptation. (laughs) (laughs) And so I want you to understand that temptation comes to attack your faith, but it attacks your faith through your flesh. And I need you to understand one of the reasons that we fall to temptation so much is because of lust. Now, I already know what's happening. In this room right now, many of you immediately thought about sex. Because when we talk about temptation... We always talk about flirting with sex, and when we say lust, we immediately think of sex. But you have to understand, every temptation is not sexual. Every lust is not sexual. Some people lust for attention, and they will do anything to get it. That's why TikTok exists. People following people in stores doing foolishness. I wish a fool would. I'm just saying, you know, we, people are so thirsty for attention and likes, and, 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 and they want more and more. And here's the thing. You got to write this down, because 90% of people who take notes when I preach go to heaven, write this down. Lust is never satisfied. That's the deception of lust. Lust is never satisfied. So even if you give in to your lust in the moment, all it does is make you want more. And then more, and then more, 
and then more, and then more, and a little more, and just a little more, and then more! And then you go from the prom queen to the prom fiend. Why? Because you wanted more. Nobody was in school when you were young. Anybody remember in kindergarten? And you were in school and they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. How many want to be a doctor when you were young? Good. Three people. All right. How many want to be a lawyer? Because you know those were the first two. These are the Huxtable Cosby days. That's, that's what we saw. You know? So we said, I want to be a basketball player. Anybody? A fireman. <laughs> Whoever said, I want to be a crackhead when I grow up. <laughs> Nobody. I don't think anybody raised their hand and said, I want to be a fiend. But it was in moments where you lusted after a feeling. You had a cigarette. I'll just smoke a little bit to, to take this off of me. And then cigarettes weren't enough. And they're nasty anyway. And so you know, you know I'm going to just, just a little weed. It's good for you anyway. It came from the earth. You know, that's what people say. But they want to smoke weed. It came from the earth. I'm going to just, you know, just a little bit take my mind off some stuff. And then you smoke weed. But then after a while, your problems got bigger. And so your blunts got bigger. But then after a while, your blunts didn't hit the way they used to hit. So what did you do? You start chasing the high. So then you want to lace it with something. And you're constantly lusting to chase a high. And now all of a sudden you're stealing somebody's TV because you're looking for a high. Everybody say lust. <laughs> what kind of church is this? So Paul, it's funny how he addresses that because he talks about Will's wrestle. And he says, we all have this part of us that has to make a decision. And he comes to this conclusion that I can't save myself and I can't do this alone. I can't do this by myself. So who can rescue me from this miserable person that I am? Because it's miserable to be stuck between two opinions. It's miserable doing the right, doing the wrong thing with the right understanding. Yeah, because I, I remember days. You ever been a kid out in the streets with your friends and you knew their parents weren't like your parents? Yeah. I had friends of different persuasions and we weren't allowed to do some of the same stuff. Like the way they grew up, it was like, just make sure you get in. It'll be okay. And they were able to do kind of what they wanted. But my mother had this rule, when the light comes on, I better see you in this house. We, we had certain rules. So there were times where, where I did something that conflicted with the rules of my house to align with the lack of rules in someone else's house. So even when I was doing the wrong thing, the right thing was in my mind. So you ever not have fun trying to have fun? Oh, my God. <laughs> and this is how God used to mess with me. I was the guy young in the club and having, thinking I'm having a good time. But in my heart, number one, I'm hoping I don't see anybody from church. And then, oh, y'all been there? Uh, and then number two, then number two, I was always scared that if I keep messing around, that God was going to turn me over to a reprobate mind. That's an old school church. That's old school. Y'all don't know nothing about that, a reprobate mind, but you'll study it later. And, 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 then, and then the third thing I was scared of was that the rapture was going to happen while I was in the club. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So, so I'm having a hard time having a good time because while everybody's doing their thing and I'm doing it too, in my mind, I'm miserable. I'm struggling. I'm wrestling because I want to be right. <laughs> and I know what's right. But temptation got me. I think I'm not the only one. <laughs> Some of y'all picturing your past right now, like, oh, my God, I was a mess. He says, who can rescue me from this miserable man that I am? And he says, here's the answer. He says, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this is important to understand that he, he, he says Jesus, and here's the thing we do. We often say it's not fair to compare Jesus to us because Jesus is God. Well, Jesus didn't have a sinful nature, so he don't know. Well, Jesus ain't been through what I've been through, so he don't know. Well, let me, let me help you. Hebrews 4.15, 
it says, uh, chapter 4, verse 15 in the NIV, it says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one that has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet. He did not sin. Just tell somebody, Jesus knows. Go ahead and tell them. Come on, you didn't tell the right person. Tell somebody, say, Jesus knows. And so as we talk about these two wills, I'll be done in a few minutes. As we talk about willpower and we talk about these two wills, it's important to understand Philippians 2.13. In the NLT, it says it this way. It says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That, that's the NLT. But let me give you, let me give you the ASV because this is really, you're going to feel this one. It says, for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So the only reason that I want to do good and I try to do good is because of God. Because on my own, I won't do it. Watch this. On my own, I won't even desire it. So God doing a work in me, the evidence of his work in me is my desire to want to do good. Mm, I hope you caught this. And so when you see someone who's trying, you can say that's God at work. And, and this is the thing that we have to understand. When God is at work in our lives, the first thing he changes is our desire. Many of us think that God changes our activity. That he changes what we do. God's not going to change what you do. He's going to change the desire in what you do. So that when you keep doing it, you might still do some of the same stuff, but you won't feel the same way. Why? Because God's at work. Mm. That's why we get miserable when we try to do what everybody... See, at this point in your life, you don't have to be perfect, but you can't be who you were in your past because you've had too much. So even when you want attention and none of your saved friends around and you having a boring weekend, so now you want to call some friends that make the weekend lit and you want to hang out and you want to do your thing. You can't do it like they do it because God's at work in you. And when he's at work in you, the way that you feel about what you used to enjoy begins to change. So now you in the club looking stupid. You can't eat you can't do none of them dances. Why? Because it ain't for you. Because God's doing the work. Some of y'all was in the mirror trying. Hey, hey, baby. You was trying. Anyway. <laughs> Yo, imagine Deacon Ed. Hey, hey, baby. <laughs> well, hey, we're going to practice. We're going to do a, we're going to try it. Okay. What kind, of, what kind of church is this? Okay, so everybody say he's at work in me. And so now we see that Jesus is tempted. I got to let you go. You're hungry. Jesus is tempted, and he's going to be tested. And, and I want you to see this. There's a couple things I want you to write down because I got to get you into heaven. The first thing you need to write down, this is really good right here, is, is this. It's not the bait. It's the bite. We put so much emphasis on the temptation, but the temptation is not the sin. It's when we turn to the temptation. It's not what's baiting you. It's what you take a bite of. I hope you're with me. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says it this way. It says the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Okay? So watch this. Temptation uh, has to be provided with an opportunity to escape. So you can't just say, I was tempted. Because wherever temptation shows up, an opportunity to escape shows up. But many of us don't take the exit. We play with the temptation. 
And we have so many opportunities. And sometimes the exit, y'all ready for this? Is run. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's it. You wait for a sign. No, run. Just run. Go. Get your keys. Run. Leave your keys. Run. Because the thing is, when, when, when you take and you bite the bait, you got problems. I told you about that a few weeks ago. I was taking samples at the food court. But I realized something. They don't give that out because it's free. They don't, they don't give it out for free because they're nice. They're not good people. Hey, we just, hey, Sean, we just want to bless you. Get some free food. They, they're not giving out. They know that once you take a bite, mm, everything will follow. Your mouth and your money. Oh, God, I hope. And, and, and don't you notice that when we give into temptation, the two things that it affects is our mouth and our money. He says, I will provide a way of escape. So you got to recognize it's not the bait. It's what you bite. Let me give you the second thing. I told you it's almost lunchtime. Let me give you the second thing. Second thing we see in verse 2, and I need you to see this. Jesus fasted for 40 days, and the Bible says when he's led by the Spirit, he's hungry. So here's the second thing I need you to write down. Anticipate the temptation. Because we act like we all know, but we know. Like you and I both know. Like I know I know. Okay, let me say it this way. Because wherever you're weak, that's where you'll be tempted. So you can't just say, uh, I didn't know this was going to happen. Yes, you did. Because you know your weaknesses. Can I go deeper with this? Your temptation is always tailored to your triggers. So, so when temptation comes, it's always going to be connected to something that triggers you. Something that sets you off. This is, why, this is why when Jesus is hungry, what's the first test? He says, take these stones and make them bread. Because it was tailored <laughs> to his trigger. You ever been so hungry, everything sounds good? You ever been hungry and been in the grocery store and the devil creep up on you and you eat them grapes? <laughs> you spit wash them. <laughs> I ate worse. I'm just. <laughs> you ever just. Have, you ever have those moments? Where when you're when you're hungry, everything sounds good. And the same way naturally is the same way spiritually that when you're hungry, every idea sounds good. Whatever you're hungry and thirsty for, it sounds good when you hear your stomach growling because your, your temptation and, and, and your test, it's always going to be tailored to your trigger, to your weak point. This is why the Bible says Eve was deceived first because she was the weaker vessel. Oh, y'all ladies got tight. You know, but hear me. The Bible says that it was Eve Fellas, y'all should have hollered back at me. I had your back right there. Ne next time she mess up, be like, see, Eve? Anyway, <laughs> married guys, chill. I'm not trying to mess up your home. But, but understand, Deacon has like, see, uh, Andrew Nick, see, you Eve. You Eve. No, I'm playing. Okay, so here's the, <laughs> here's the thing. <laughs> but it says that she was the weaker vessel. That's why she was deceived first. Every place of your weakness you're going to find a trigger. And temptation is going to attack that weak spot. And, and so here's the important thing. You have to know your weakness. Don't act ignorant to your weaknesses. 
Come on, I know you're saved now. I know you're motivated. I know you're coming to church. I know it's, you love Jesus, but you still got weaknesses. As long as you have flesh, you're going to have some things that are fighting against you. You're going to have some things that you know better. There's going to be some stuff that you like. Yeah, but okay, okay. Let me put it this way. You ever try to close your eyes and do some stuff? And I'm not just talking about physically, but I'm talking about like mentally close your eyes. Like I'm just going to go ahead and do this. I'm, I know I'm not supposed to. This is going to be the last time. This is just this one time. And, and, and the funny thing is we play in our areas of weakness and act like it ain't a weakness. Do you understand? There are some things God will deliver you from. And there are some things you have to pray through. Because not everything God is going to take from you. Some stuff, he just has to give you the power to say no. So watch this. You can be saved and still want it. Oh, God. Can, I, can we stay here for a moment? Because there's some things about you that may not have been redeemed yet. And you might have some desires and some things and some people and some places and some stuff that you want that you know is not God. And just because you want it don't mean you need it, deserve it, or God wants it for you. So some stuff, you can't say, things like, oh, if God didn't want me to have it, he'll take the desire. No, that's, that's immature and stupid. He's, there's something Paul even said. He said, I prayed that the Lord would take it away three times. But he said, I continue to wrestle in my flesh. There's this thorn in my flesh. There's this thing that I keep fighting against. It's a desire. There's in all of us, there's a desire that's ungodly. And the only way that we're going to get through it is to trust him in the process. He ain't going to take everything from you. So you have to know your weakness. Jesus was hungry. And so watch this. In your era, this is just wisdom, but any area where you're weak, there's two things you need. Distance and accountability. You need distance from places or people that bring you back to what you should be delivered from. Some people, they are nice, but they are not needed. And we will go to hell trying to make other people feel comfortable. And we're too afraid to hurt feelings. So we're ruining our future over feelings of people that will turn on us in a minute anyway. And, and, there, and watch this. There are some people that even if you turn your back on now, God can bring back later in the right time. But we need distance. That's just wisdom. We need distance and we need accountability. If you have a drinking problem, don't go to the bar. It's just simple. You don't smoke no more. So stop hanging out with people who smoke. It's, it's like, and, and we try to make this more spiritual than it has to be. S create distance between you and what was you. The second thing, we need accountability. We need people that don't have the same struggle to help us stay out of our past. Because we do slick stuff. See, y'all don't have, I'm not, I'm not the pastor who's just going to say a whole bunch of church stuff to make you feel good. I'm going to be honest with you because we got to live this when we leave. And, and there are some struggles we have and some stuff we try to act ignorant of. You know who you can call for what. Can we just be honest? Like, you know when you really, really, really want to hear from God, you have a few people you know to call. You know they're going to pray. They're, gonna, they're the people that get on your nerves now because they're going to say stuff when you don't want to hear it. They're going to say it anyway. And you know when you really, you know, you, you say you want to hear from God, but you call them friends that really going to tell you what you want to hear. Girl, we can go over there right now. We can put our hands on them, you know. We can pull up, and you, you know who to call. And then we act stupid when we call the wrong people. Like, you knew what you was going to get when you called them. But you're going to act like, no, I just, I just needed somebody. To, you know who you was calling. So we need accountability from people who don't have the same struggle. Does that make sense? Okay, let me go forward. Is this good? 
Okay, watch this. And, and here's what we have to pay attention to. James 1.14 says this. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So every temptation, remember I was talking about triggers, every temptation is stemmed from our own desires. You can't be tempted by something you don't want. It can't be a temptation if you don't want it. It just doesn't even make sense. You have to want it for it to be a temptation. And so we have to pay attention to the things that we want and start being honest. Y'all ain't ready for what I'm about to say. About the ungodly things we desire. I think that was too deep for a Sunday. We might have to pick this up another day because I don't think you're really ready. You didn't come to church for all this because we like to imagine over our struggle. I just like to see myself positive, my daily affirmations. I'm going to wake up in the morning and pop. All of that's cute. It's good. But don't forget there's some stuff that exists not around you but in you. There's stuff in you that you have to be aware of and you need trustworthy people that are aware of who you really are so they can hold you accountable for who you really are. I, I know you got brothers and sisters in church and we all love each other, but everybody can't handle your struggle. But you do got to give it to somebody else and Jesus. Okay, there are some Things I know y'all y'all ain't gonna like this, and it's okay. I was prepared. Um, there are some things, some sins, that moments in my life I say no to, not primarily because of God. Sometimes because of you. Yeah, see, I I knew that was gonna be too deep. Because the reality is, sometimes we live in the space God's not, I can't see him. I know he can see me. And I know he sees me knowing I see that he's there, but I can't see him. And he knows that. But still, sometimes I don't feel that pressure because I don't feel like he's physically there. And I feel like I know that in my struggle, God will forgive me. But I also realize you might not. And I also realize that if I fall, some of you might fall. Mm, that was too heavy for you. So not every no is only because of God. Some know is the accountability for the people that God has entrusted. And this is why I'm saying this. You have to have, a, you have, to have an understanding that this is bigger than you. Oh, uh, this is my relationship between me and God. It ain't just you and God. The Bible says, let your light shine so that men see your good works and glorify the Father. But if they see your light shine, they'll also see your darkness ride too. So you got to be careful. You have to be accountable. Everybody say accountability. accountability. And, and here's the crazy part. Be careful because when temptation comes, it's the craziest times. Denzel said it's at your highest moment. And we see it because Jesus just got baptized. Prior to this, he's baptized by John the Baptist. The dove happens, dove comes, heaven opens, dove floats down representing the Holy Spirit, and after the dove comes the devil. And you got to be careful in your life because after the dove, the devil will always show up. 
He always show up after your high moment. He's in a new place. He's in a, he's in a new season. He's in a new understanding, a new perspective. It was just a now. It was confirmed. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is God on earth. This is who you all have been waiting for. This just happened, and now the devil shows up to test them. Don't you think for a minute, just because you're at a high moment, that it's all good. That's the place where Satan wants you. He wants you at the point that you feel like it's all good now. He wants you at the point where you're comfortable, where you're kicking your feet up like, whew, I love being a Christian. Love being saved. Come on, you ever have those good weeks? You just listen to all worship music? Just mess up speaking in tongues in the middle of a song? Crying in the living room. I love this place. You so in the spirit, you drive and cry and sing and worship song. You open your Bible and read the perfect scripture that you needed in that moment. Like, oh my God. It, it, just an amazing week. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> everything happened. Because it's in that comfortable space where your guard is down, where the enemy comes. Is this good to anybody? Yeah. All right, let me hurry up and give you this. So, so what he does is he, he says he has to prepare spiritually before it comes. In other words, fast first. Now, what am I saying? I'm not just telling you fast. Yes, we should fast. We're believers. We should fast. We should deny ourselves. But the fast represents preparation. So we got to prepare for the temptation. That means that if I know my weakness and I know where I'm going to be tested and tempted and I know it's going to be tailored to my trigger, then I don't have an excuse when it comes that I wasn't ready. No, that means that now that I'm listening to this message and I'm thinking about my weaknesses and I'm thinking about the fact that God has always given me an exit escape and a strategy to move out of this, that means when I leave, I need to read some scriptures about my struggle. I need to read some scriptures about how to get through this. I need to pray up. I need more Holy Spirit. I need me in him <laughs> even more. I, I need to give myself to him even more. I need to make sure that I'm prepared because I know something's coming. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to live ready. He wants us to live to build up our inner man so that we can have the ability to resist. Because many people try to prepare after the attack comes. You don't want to prepare after. You have to get ready. It's called preseason. You got to get ready before the season starts. Okay, let me give you this, and we're done. I promise. Here's the third thing you got to write down. This is good stuff. Play it out before it plays you out. Okay? What I want you to think about, consider the cost of your temptation. What will it cost you? Like, where is this going to lead you beyond the moment? One thing I've learned, you can choose your decision, but you can't choose your consequences. And some of the things that we fall into have a long-lasting effect. So even though it might have seemed like it was for one moment, you don't know how it's going to affect and impact the rest of your life. One moment, one decision. And the consequences are crazy. Watch this. Um, the devil does something that's tricky, though. And this, is where, this is why we have Bible study in this church. Not old school church. Old school church had Bible study. It was the pastor getting up and just preaching again. But, but we have Bible study. Like, we open the Bible, and we go through it, and we talk, and we, we talk this out. We have small groups to go back over the message and read some scriptures and talk it out. The reason that this is important, and the reason I tell you a growing church is a knowing church, is simply this. Because when the enemy comes, you have to know the word of God. And I know that sounds cliche. I know that's not a big point to you. You might be like, yeah, man, Pastor Jay, that's what you're supposed to be. But hear what I'm saying. You, you got to understand how important it is. There are so many believers that lack knowing the word of God. And I'm not just talking about repeating and quoting a scripture. I'm talking about knowing the word of God. Why? Because there's so many, uh, there's so much opposition that will come with a word and the word, but it's incomplete. And because we don't know it, somebody say something, well, the Bible says, and we'd be like, uh, yeah, that sound about right. You ever have one of them Hebrew Israelites come up to you? Do you know who you are? We, and thus saith the Lord unto thee. 
and they're telling you, you know, you're a god and people should kiss your feet and you don't know who you are, black man, black queen, black woman. And they're quoting scriptures out of context. Or you have the Jehovah's Witnesses. Are you prepared for Jehovah's return? Tell me about Jesus. Well, he was a good guy, but he's not Lord. I'm going to show you right here. And they read scriptures, and people will tell you all these scriptures, and you're sitting there like, and you can't even argue. And then we, we have ignorant arguments. Because when we don't know what to say, what do we do? I don't know what it says exactly, but all I know, in my experience, as if your experience is equal to scripture. And I know that sounds good. Oh, I know what he did for me. See, in my experience, all that sounds good. But watch this. What happens when your experience doesn't match the word of God? So your experience alone is not enough. Your experience should be qualified by the word of God. So we have to know the word. Why? Because what does Satan do when he comes to Jesus? He quotes the word. Okay, let me prove it. He quotes it. He says, if, if you want, if you really want all this, take these rocks, turn them to stone. Jesus quotes the word for real. He comes back later with the second test, quotes the word for real. Then he, then he comes back the third time, and Satan tells him, he says, jump. <laughs> jump off the mountain. Jump on the second test. He says, jump off the mountain, and, and the angels will catch you. Jesus is like, dude, are you serious? You think you're going to trick the word with the word? When I'm not just, I don't just know the word, I am the word. Watch what he says. He's, enemies quoting Psalm 91, uh, 9 through 12. Watch what he says. He says, if you say, the Lord is my refuge, I'm going to show you something. And you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. See, what the enemy did, he said, okay, okay, since you're the son of God, you're that dude, why don't you just prove it? Why don't you jump and let the angels catch you since you're that guy? But the Bible doesn't say tempt God that way. The, the, the scripture says, if you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, then this thing will happen. See, what happens is when we don't know the word, we get caught up on one part and we miss. So, so, so now we have incomplete word over our life. So we're waiting for the right thing the wrong way. We have false expectations because God says do this and we're expecting God to bless us. But if we don't know the word, then we'll miss the recipe for the blessing. So yes, the, the blessing belongs to his children, but there's also a recipe for the children to follow so that the blessing comes. But we'll be standing there with no recipe, just waiting for a blessing. That's not going to happen until we do what the recipe says. So I need the, a complete word, not an incomplete word. And I need to know it for myself. Same thing that happens with Eve in the garden. Satan appears. He's like, oh, did God really say, will you surely die? And, and he's like, God knows in that day you're going to be just like him. She's like, uh, you right. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And she's, she didn't really focus on what the word said. She heard it through the wrong voice. So we got to know it for ourselves. Play it out before it plays you out. So there's a few questions you should consider, and, I, and I, we got to go. How will I feel after the laughter? Because some of us, can we, can we just be honest? How many of you ever had to do the walk of shame? Okay, put your hands down quick. Put them down. Put them down. If you don't know what that is, just keep it down. You don't need to know. But y'all, the walk of shame early in the morning, yesterday's close. Okay. Um, how will this affect others? How will this affect others? How will this affect my relationship with God? How would I feel about sharing this decision with someone later? Would I be ashamed to talk about it? Will this set me up or set me back? How will this affect those who look up to me? Play it out. Before it plays you out. Jesus says this and we're done. Jesus looks at Satan after these three tests. 
Jesus passed the test. He doesn't just stand there waiting. He says, beat it, Satan. <laughs> like, you got to go. Like, there's a point that I'm not going to take anymore. You got to go. In all of our lives, I'm not saying that there's a point where you'll ever stop being tempted. But I am saying there is a point in your life where you have to stop allowing Satan to be comfortable in your space. I've been here before, beat it. I know what the word says, beat it. I know God's expectation, beat it. I, I know what God has for me, beat it. This is not worth it, beat it. The risk is not worth the reward, beat it. So you got to get to a point where you just say, Satan, beat it. Because it's not worth giving up what God has for me. The Bible says it this way, what does it profit a man? To gain the whole world and lose his only soul. Everybody shout willpower. Come on, let's stand all over this room.